You've probably been there at some point in your career, diving right into a complex code base, trying to understand where the code begins and the mess ends. It probably made you want to run away the minute no one was looking. And trust me, I mean, I've been there, we've all met. But there are many solutions to that problem. One of them, the one that we're gonna be talking about in this video is domain driven design. You can think of it as a blueprint for turning that messy code base into a well-organized React masterpiece. And yes, because today we're gonna to be talking about DDD applied to React, so let's go. So what really is DDD or domain driven design? To be honest, DDD is a very complex subject and in this video, I'm not gonna go in depth in it. I'm just gonna cover it from a practical point of view. If you want to go more in depth and you want to learn more about it, I invite you to follow one of the links in the description to read more about DDD. That said, you can think of domain driven design as a framework that you can follow to properly structure your project. And that's it, essentially. If you follow DDD, in the end, you'll end up with a properly structured project with components that make sense, put together and not coupled with components that really have nothing to do with each other from a business point of view. And the two concepts that we're gonna be really keen into following in this particular video are gonna be bounded context and entities. Bounded contexts are essentially high level boxes think of them like that, uh, where you're gonna be putting components that make sense to be together. Uh, how you define those bounded boxes? You define them by, follow, by thinking of the core business needs of your application. For example, if you're running a, an e-commerce site, some of those uh, bounded contexts could be user management, stock management, shopping cart management, and you know things like that. So you would end up structuring you know folders within your project in a way that it follows that high level structure and the entities are going to be components residing within those bounded boxes and in this video i'm going to show you how to apply those concepts into a react code base so that the next time you have to start a new project you have the right tools to do it all right so now to better understand the power on, and the benefits of ddd um, i want to tell you uh, fiction story of a fake company that we're gonna be calling Company X. This company was developing a very complex project, one that involved user management, inventory management, order management, and really it was a truly complex and huge application. But as time went on, the engineering team at Company X realized that they were starting to deal with a very messy structure, a very messy code. And on top of that, if you add the complexity of properly managing state in React within a very complex and big application, then they realized that they were in trouble. They were not able to scale the project. Every little change that they were making was causing full redeploys and really long QA cycles because they had to recheck everything because everything was tied together. So the solution that they were looking for was applying, uh, doing a review of the project and applying domain driven design principles into it. The first thing that they did, which is the first thing that you're gonna be doing for any DDD-based endeavor, is they identify the core business need of their application. And for that, and through that, they created what we already covered, the bounded context. In the end, they created two big bounded contexts, user management and inventory management. Within each context, they created the entities that made sense within them and that would drive the development down the line. If, for example, in the user management, they create the user entity, and in the inventory management, they create the order entity. But on top of that, like I said, DDD is just a basic framework that gives you guidelines on how to structure your code, but there are no tools. So since they were using React for this application, they went on to create custom hooks, which is gonna be a really handy tool when it comes to applying DDD and modifying your structure to encapsulate the behavior of these entities, especially so if you have to also deal with a complex state management scenario for your project. So in the end, they created custom hooks for each context, hooks like use order, use user, that would give them the tools to access those contexts in a clean and ordered way within, you know, within their code base. So in the end, with the custom hooks, they created a perfectly maintainable state management system 
that was uh, that was tailored for the needs of, of their application. There was no boilerplate code, there was no extra code, extra logic that they didn't need. It was simply the perfect solution for their needs. And that was thanks to the use of hooks coupled with the guidelines of DDD. Throughout the video, I'm gonna be leaving some links ar around DDD and how to use it with React. So if you want to read more and know more about this concept, just make sure you check them out. Now let's look into a more practical approach and let's see how we can implement these concepts of the domain-driven design into a React application and what tools will we use to do so. Now that's enough of theory and fake companies. Um, let's go into a more practical approach. For this example though, uh, one tool, one extra tool that I'm gonna be using um, because it really fits with the domain driven approach uh, that we're trying to, that I'm trying to show you here, uh, it's called Bit. If you don't know what Bit is, I'm gonna leave links in the description for you to uh, read more about it, but it's essentially a one tool that solves all your workflow problems uh, when it comes to developing a brand new software project. It also follows a very interesting approach called component-driven design, which is very similar to domain-driven design that fits very well with domain-driven design and React, essentially. But it also gives you a very web development-oriented approach, thinking of components, thinking of how they relate to each other uh, and how you can reuse them in different projects. So really, uh, Bit and the Bit CLI, which is what I'm gonna be using here, um, it's a perfect tool when it comes to uh, applying these DDD concepts into our uh, web project. In our case, it's gonna be React-based. With that said, let's move on. So uh, we're gonna be creating, or not really creating a full e-commerce site, but so I'm gonna show you how you can create these bounded contexts that we talked about and the entities that live within them, essentially the components and the hooks that we're gonna be uh, describing using Bit. When you're following DDD, you'll want to structure your components around the bounded context. And in the, when you're using Bit, the concept of bounded context is you can map it to their concept of scopes, which is simply a logical grouping of components. And we're gonna be talking about scopes and bounded context uh, interchangeably in this video. So for example, um, for our e-commerce application that we're gonna be dealing with here, you know, you might have a bounded context for managing product listing, um, bounded context for managing customer accounts, and even a third one for managing orders. So within each bounded context, you'll create components that are specific to that context. So for example, in the customer account context, you might have components for creating and updating accounts, resetting passwords, or even managing payment methods. So using Bit, we can create those components with Bit's CLI tool very easily. Here I'm showing a brand new project. And the first thing that we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be creating a, a React workspace to put our components into. You can create as many workspaces as you want. This is simply a way for you to temporarily develop your components before you push them out and share them with the rest of your team and other teams if you want to, which is something that Bit allows you to do, but we're not gonna be ex uh, extensively covering it in this video. So with this line, we are creating a brand new React workspace uh, using Bit. Now, essentially what this is gonna be doing is, other than initiating the workspace uh, with several files that Bit needs, it's also gonna create a folder called workspace, and that is where we're gonna be working from now on. All, the, uh, all our creations through Bit are gonna be inside the workspace. And with that done, we can start creating the components within the bounded context. Now, how are we gonna do that? Again, we're gonna be using Bit CLI. <clears throat> but first, we have to move into the workspace. As you can see from the folder structure right now, we have the folder called workspace and there is barely anything else that we care about right now. Everything else is just, these are files that are needed by bit and they're not really of our interest at the moment. So the first component that we're gonna create is the one to manage the creation and update of uh, new customers. So let's just create 
a react component we'll put them within the folder called customer and then we'll just um, call it form or let's just say customer form and remember we talked about scopes being the same as bounded context so here we're going to specify the scope called customer account and that is what's going to determine within which folder this new component gets created it was pretty pretty fast and you can see here that we have the customer form within the customer account within the customer folder and here within our uh, workspace the new folder was, was created let's see the full path here you can see the customer component was uh, has a folder and then several files inside it these are all thanks to bit uh, here we have the actual component that we have to replace this is just boilerplate code and then other files that are related to bit um, extra work doing things that I, um, creating a spec file where we can write the test for the component a composition file where we can write different examples of how to use this component I'll leave um, links in the description if you want to know more about these files and how to use them and make the most out of them but this is the first the the first component we also wanted to create the password reset and the payment method and we can do so exactly in the same way we simply uh, say bit create react and we'll put them within customer folder and say password reset and again we specify the scope which is the bounded context uh, in our case and say customer account now our customer account uh, bounded context or scope has two components and we'll add the third one real quick react customer uh, payment oops payment methods and again specify the scope customer account now these commands create the structure that you see on the left hand side of the uh, of the screen we've established that all these three entities all these three components can now live within the customer account bounded context now what else can we do in addition to structuring components by bounded context like we discussed you also want to ensure that your components are modular and reusable. This means separating concern and creating components that can be easily composed together to create a more complex functionality. And this is where uh, Bit shines because it follows the CDD, which we discussed before, the component-driven uh, development. So following CDD, the components that you create through Bit are gonna be easily composed together and bit will give you everything that you need to start using it and using them together as if they were external dependencies without really coupling their code um, together in any fashion so if you want to know more about how to use composable components with bit follow one of the links in the uh, video description i'm going to add them there everything that you want to know <clears throat> so one way to achieve this modularity is by using react hooks so hooks will allow you to encapsulate the state and the behavior in a reusable function so let's put an example let's say that you have a bounded context for managing the product listings within that context you might have a product list component that displays the list of products essentially um, and to manage the state of the product list you create a custom hook called let's say use product list that hook will encapsulate all the state and behavior related to the list of products so let's create both the component and the hook using bit for both so essentially in the same way that we've been working so far within our workspace we'll do bit create react product and then the name of the component will be list within the scope of product listing management all right and now let's create the hook in the same fashion we create react but we'll put them inside we'll put the hook inside the hooks folder and call it use product list and notice the dashes i'm using the name of the component here because they'll be relevant in a second we'll also specify the scope product listing management now with that done um, 
we can see that the folder structure on the left shows the same logical separation that we saw before. This time the bounded context was no probability man listing management, which we, ca we can see here of uh, both our, co our component, the hook and the product. Uh, now for the hook, if we go to the code file, uh, here clearly we can see that the boilerplate code doesn't really make sense for us. But do notice that the use for this hook was almost correctly named. It was named following the component naming conventions for React. Uh, in the case of hook, we would simply uh, change the first uppercase letter to a um, lowercase letter. That said, the full code for this hook would look something like this. And as you can see, the use proc list hook in the end keeps an internal state variable of products. And during the use effect hook, it essentially during the first loading of the component, it'll fetch the list of components from this um, internal API endpoint. We haven't really coded that endpoint, but uh, you can fill in the gaps and essentially this endpoint, it would return a JSON list of, of products which we would set on the internal state variable, and that's it. Uh, apart from that, it also exposes two methods, the add product and remove product, so that we can uh, manage the list properly, as stated, and it will expose so the, the actual list and these two methods, and that's it. Now, you could then use this hook in your product list component to display the list of products, essentially. For the list of products, we could go to our list.tsx file, and we have the same deal. This is the boilerplate code that we don't want. We'll simply uh, add the code of our product list component. Here, I'll remove the boilerplate code. And I've left one single line without copying, which I want you to see how uh, it auto completes. Because I'm not, uh, I haven't really imported the actual uh, use product hook. So I'm going to import the use product list but uh, I'm going to import it from my org slash product listings. Notice how I have here the autocomplete as if it was an actual third party library that I have installed. I'm not referencing my hook using a relative path here because I will couple my implementation of the product list to the hook. And if I wanted to use all the hooks or all the components within this uh, product list component, the same thing will happen. If I use uh, the relative path, then they will uh, be coupled together and then they will not be, I will not be able to share them or compose them together with other, in other projects. But thanks to Bit and the way it handles the creation of the components, uh, I have uh, symbolic links within the node modules folder pointing to the right direct uh, to right folder on my local project for each of these components and hooks that I've created. So for this, I'm going to point it to the first of these autocomplete options. And as you can see, I'm still getting one error and that is because even though I changed the name of the hook that I'm exporting, I forgot to change the index file here of the hook, which is a simple, a very simple change. I need to downcase the letter here and remove the type because I really don't want to export the type here. So now if I go back to the project, you notice I am properly importing the hook that I just created. So in this example, the product list component uses the use product list hook as expected to manage the state of the product list. It displays the list of products using the map uh, method and it provides also the button for adding and removing products from the list. As you can see here, by interacting with the add product or remove product methods. By using the hook and state in this way, you can create modular and reusable components that are tightly coupled to the business needs of your application, not to each other. This can make it easier to extend and modify your application over time as your application grows and evolves together. This is for the practical example. I know the application isn't finished, but building the whole application will make this video way too long. And I really wanted to focus on how domain-driven design really improves the end result when applied to web new projects, especially in the case of React, and especially so coupled with a tool like Bit, which brings the composable aspects into, into the game and simplifies the entire workflow by giving you a single tool to do everything from creating the components to 
reusing them to eventually share them, which I'll add this, uh, links in the description to um, if you want to know more about that aspect of it as well. In the end, applying DDD into a new React project or even an existing one that needs refactoring will improve the quality of the end result in multiple ways. It will simplify um, the whole structure, internal structure, not by either removing concepts or entities or by removing code, but by making it simpler to browse, making, making it simpler to understand because the internal structure will be tied to the business needs, which are more human friendly that whatever internal structure that a group of developers might have come up with based on the code that they were writing. It will also uh, foster collaboration, mainly because it gives everyone, not only on the development team, but on the project team, this uh, a common language or a lingua franca, if you will, to discuss either problems or new features or even the current state of the project. And this aspect actually gets amplified if you couple it with BIT, that has a lot of collaborative uh, benefits, a lot of collaborative tools to share and reuse components that are created using this paradigm. And finally, another very notable benefit that you will get is the improved maintainability of your code. Again, not directly because of how you write your code, but uh, on the fact that it follows a very logical distribution and a very maintainable architecture, internal architecture, your code will be easier to maintain and to refactor in the future if you need to. In the end, using domain-driven design on top of an existing or a brand new React project makes total sense, especially so if you follow a very component-driven approach, which, again, coupled with tools like me, that makes it even easier and faster on the dev team, the results can be great, and you can create a project that from the architectural point of view of your code will grow faster and it will scale much easier. So I would like to know if you had similar experiences using DDD on your own projects or even using BIT. So feel free to share your experiences on the comments below. And remember that on the video description, I've added a lot of links related to BIT and how to use it. So if you haven't really seen or used this tool before, they'll come in very handy. Until next one, make sure to click and subscribe to the channel and see you on the next one. Bye. See you. Take care. Bye.